y'all. <laughs> uh, I hope you can see this. <laughs> I hope you can see this. We, I have switched to this um, to StreamYard because I was the one that I was using wasn't working for me, and I um, I tested it on something. But then tonight, when I tried to share my um, when I tried to share my PowerPoint, I was like in absolute panic mode because it's the first time I've done it with this. So, hi, welcome to the new platform. Here's something that is cool about it. I can highlight your comments. So I'm really excited to be able to do that. So I hope that we like it because I'm going to be able to celebrate that Michael Archer got a 96 in band. So good job. Um, all right. So welcome, everyone. And let me actually go back because we're not at the first. Oh, OK, wait. I might not be able to control my PowerPoint. <laughs> um, let's see. Can I? That's just a video of it. I got to figure out how to advance my slides, guys, but then we'll figure it out. OK, thank you for thinking the settings are cool. It won't be cool if we're on the same slide for an hour. But um, oh, there we go. There we go. OK. All right. Well, first, let's go back. Now I figured out how to do it. OK, any of you. Hi, <laughs> welcome. If any, that was your worst score. Sorry, Michael Archer, didn't mean to celebrate your worst score. Um, OK, those of you who have read any of Raul Dahl's other stuff, so if you've read Matilda, Willy Wonka, or Charlie and Chocolate Factory, um, Danny, the Champion of the World, BFG, if you've read any of his other stuff, do you see any similarities between this story and that? So curious about that. What If you do see any similarities, what do you see? Um, I'll, I'll share with you. I'll let some answers come in, and then I'll share with you what I think. And then we're ready for the rating. One to five, you guys. Um, okay, Ethan says this story was way darker, way darker. Uh, I don't know. Like, think about, well, yeah, I mean, it's dark because there's like a murder and everything. But think about in Willy Wonka how dark that is. Like, Willy Wonka is so, so, so dark. When you think about, like, Blueberry Girl and how kind of vicious it is. I don't know. Curious. All right. Well, there's Dracon with a five and Siren edits with a one. What? You did not like this story? Oh, wow. I love this story. I, I've been looking forward to teaching this story like all, all week long. All right. So we'll wait to see. Um, let's see what Michael has to say here. In all of his books, revenge takes a big place. Like the wife was taking revenge. Yeah. I think, I think you're kind of right. Yeah. That's an interesting point. That's an interesting point. Okay. So let's, okay. Let me highlight some of what Strudel Kitty, urgh, a negative number, no integers. <laughs> All right. Let's look at what we got last week. Mark C said it's about to get dark. And he was talking about that class. And it could have been tonight too. I laughed when I saw this. And then Strudel Kitty said, all the books that have like made her cry, Forest of Secrets, Fifth and Sixth Harry Potter, this book, which she's talking about, A Day No Pigs Would Die, Flowers for Algernon. And then <laughs> I thought it was funny when Michael said, and here we have the mini spellings of Baron Von Weasel, because when I showed the picture of the weasel, then that was fun. All right. And then uh, Michael Archer, the keeper of the hashtags. So um, thank you, keeper of the hashtags. And then I... I was asking about how you think he's feeling. And I loved reading through, like sometimes the chat goes by so quickly that I can't really follow it all together. I'll see like some, but not all. And when I can see a whole thread of them like this, where you guys are interacting with each other, I just, I just love it. And um, so in this one, I really loved how many different adjectives that you used, like so many different feelings, so many different possible feelings about what he was thinking. And I thought all of them were, all of them were appropriate. Horror, disgust, guilt, sickened, anxious, shocked, empathetic, disturbed, like all of these things are such great words. Good job on that. And then I, I thought about it when I was reading those and I decided to go pull this, this screenshot up 
because they've actually done research to show that people who read have more empathy. Like people who read fiction, people who read fiction in particular, develop more empathy than people who don't. And I think that is super cool. So I thought I would just give you a shout out. Okay, so, and then, and then um, Michael said, oh, did any of you notice that his grammar improved over the course of the book? I thought it was really interesting how the author did that. It's a perfect reflection of Rob's going up, growing up. And I thought that was nice of Michael to point that out, especially because he's kind of burned out on this coming of age novel. And so that was, that was cool. But also I didn't notice that and I'm supposed to be the teacher. So um, kudos and points to Michael, who is apparently not here yet to um, get his, um, get his kudos. Um, let's highlight this. Drew is telling us that this is very similar to a Greek myth um, of Tantalus, where an angered Greek king and child of Zeus named Tantalus tricks the gods into eating the body parts of his son Pelops and after succeeding and being caught, forced to be tortured with starvation. That actually sounds like a Harry Potter um, like spell, right? Starvation. Um, the stream is looking odd. Dracon, you're going to have to be a little bit more... Um, like specific, <laughs> what do you mean? And I'll, I can ask um, Mr. Van Star if he's noticing something on it. I think it's just the, I think he's talking about the layout. Oh, if it's just the layout, that's the new layout. That's just the new layout. If you weren't here right in the beginning, you didn't hear me, my little panic thing there. Okay, so, um, well, before I highlight Cloud Falls, let's look at what Drew's saying here. I want to point out how this modern writer delivers a story with more relatable characters and conflicts. And so that's super cool. Yeah, I think one of the things that that's an important point about Drew is that um, is that mythology is really important in order to understand most literature, just like the Bible, just like a few canonical works. You they get alluded to all the time, and really everything is a remix. And so it came it came from somewhere. Okay, so Cloudfall says, well, the quote about both dying and being born being dirty business, like the beginning and the end are opposites, but they both share this trait of being dirty. And I just love it when you guys figure out these connections just is awesome. Okay, so then um, we have, okay, here we go. This was when I asked you guys, he had it like down the valley, across the valley was yellow with golden rod like and then you guys had all these like an immature sun in all its glory and we know that michael archer knows that that it's doesn't actually need the apostrophe but we're gonna let that slide because we don't really worry about grammar and chats but just i don't want anybody to think i don't know because then i would get the hashtag english teacher fell mark c says like the hillside was a cork board full of bright yellow post-it notes i like that one um tips of immature wheat was nice cloudfall i was like powdered pencils that isn't something i've heard about before and then um uh jay sand with the um lemon drops i really liked that so there you go uh okay so i don't know who siren edits is so you said takes credit even though your name isn't that anymore i don't know who you are okay and then um jay sand saying mrs vanstar should do asmr i totally would it's love Jay to Sand. do. Siren edits is Jay Sand. Oh, Siren edits is Jay Sand. Oh, okay. Well, hi. Um, thank you, Ethan. So um, I think it would be super fun to do ASMR. I like ASMR and I find some stuff to be ASMR that I don't think was supposed to be ASMR. All right. Cloudfall says they should create another option. Like instead, what she's talking about is when Pinky could either breed more pigs or be bacon. And Cloudfall is saying, they should create another option. Like, could she act like a cart donkey or a hunting companion like a dog? And I just love this. And then I liked Mark created this new hashtag, Pinky the Cart Donkey. And um, Michael Archer, I definitely need you to um, add Pinky the Cart Monkey to the hashtags because I think that's awesome. Well, uh, Jay Sand, that's fine. We know who you are now, as long as we know who you are now. Okay, Deb says, or well, Michael says, he hates his dad for dying, not burning him with man 
manhood. And then um, I don't know if it's Sonia or Sonia. I'm not sure. He hates the situation, but to him, his father is the one who carries out the action. And I, I thought that was a nice nuance of that, that you, it's sometimes difficult to split out the action from the person. Like you hear people say, like you hear people say, I don't hate the person, but I hate what you do. I, I think Sonia's really picking out here. I don't know that that's really always possible to do. All right. Thank you, Michael Archer. Okay. And then Clownfall says that little moment of being poor as hell was a material failing in his life. He didn't actually think that. Whereas the part about how they or his father aren't or weren't poor is what he truly thinks. And I feel like that is the, um, I, I think that's something that happens to us a lot, right? Like we, we have, oops, sorry, advanced too fast. Um, is it, we, are like we think we feel something in the moment and in that moment we are so intense in that feeling we're sure that we feel that thing but then later it's like you know what that's not really how i did yeah um and then michael says lamb to the slaughter that sounds so gruesome and depressing i love it already and then he's not here and i thought his sister was going to be here too i was all excited and um i say it's dark and he starts chanting darkness, darkness. And then Jason, someone has called my name. And I laughed out loud when I saw that, you guys. All right, so you ready to dive into this dark, dark story and convert Strudel Kitty? Okay, let's visit the plot. This plot is interesting. This plot has an interesting little hiccup. All right, so backstory, domestic goddess housewife waits at home for husband and then the inciting incident, I think the inciting incident is when the husband, I mean, I guess you could argue it's just that when he comes home, but I think really it's when he says, I've got something to tell you. Um, and she, so then the rising action is she freaks out, grabs lamb to cook for dinner anyway, because yes, when you're pregnant and your husband tells you he's leaving you, the first thing you do is you want to, um, you want to cook him dinner. You know what, Drew? I haven't seen Cookie Cookie in weeks, like like classes, multiple classes. I don't know what's happened. I miss her. Um, OK, so, um, it, you know, it's not real school, so I can't just like send her parents an email <laughs> like, hey, Cookie's been missing class. Um, so she does this and then the climax, she hits him on the head with a leg of lamb and kills him. But then and and then the falling action she like tries to play it cool and there's this investigation but then we get this but wait there's a second climax because the police notice that the oven is on and it's like huh the murder weapons in there right and so then we get that second climax more falling action as the police eat the evidence and then um, this, this interesting resolution, super, super brief. And some authors do that. Some authors will, um, some authors will give almost no resolution, like just a couple of words, a few words, and that's what you get here. All right. So any thoughts on this? Any thoughts about, um, yeah, Drake on no, he is definitely leaving her. He's definitely leaving her because I mean, they leave a bunch of that out and we'll get into that. But it says, I'll give you money and see that you're looked after. Yeah. Um, anybody have any disagreements about, hey, Marksy, um, any disagreements or other opinions, not necessarily disagreements, but other thoughts about the um, about the plot here? Anything? Oh, Dracon agrees 100%. Nice. Um, but you don't have to. Interested. What do you think about that, like, Climax fall. Oop, another like climax. It's kind of interesting, I think. All right, but then I'm an English teacher. I find it all interesting. Okay, there is a very cool James Bond connection to this story. So Raoul Dahl is a very interesting guy. So he was born in Wales, but his parents were actually Norwegian. So he's 100% Norwegian. He was actually named after. Here is something for trivia. If you're ever on Jeopardy, if you're ever on Jeopardy, you will win with this that um, he is named after the Norwegian explorer, Rald Amundsen, who was the first person to reach the South Pole. So um, he's that's who he's named after. But he was in the war. He actually ended up being a spy. And he was friends with Ian Fleming, who wrote the James Bond books. They were actually 
friends is crazy, right? They're both spies and they were friends. And, and, um, and Ian Fleming told, um, told Raoul Dahl one time, you should write a story where a woman kills her husband with a leg of lamb, a frozen leg of lamb and, and then feeds the evidence to the police. Like that's where Roald Dahl got the idea for the story was from Ian Fleming who wrote the James Bond books. So I think that that is super, super, super cool. And this is Ian Fleming. This is Ian Fleming who wrote James Bond. Okay. So then here's a little bit of other trivia about the story that I think you might be interested in. They did make a movie of it in like 2002 or something, 2004. Um, but it was also, he published this story in 1953. And then in 1958, Alfred Hitchcock made it to, um, made it in as an episode of his show, Alfred Hitchcock Presents. And, and Raoul Dahl actually wrote that screenplay. And it was one of the few episodes of Alfred Hitchcock Presents that Alfred Hitchcock actually directed himself. So if you can find an old version of that and watch it, that is actually Alfred Hitchcock directing and actually Raoul Dahl who wrote that screenplay. And it starred Barbara Bel Geddes, who that very same year starred in a very famous movie called Vertigo, one of the most famous movies of all time. And then she became Miss Ellie on the TV show Dallas um, that played forever. So she was a really famous actress and she played um, Mary Maloney. All right, so just a little backstory trivia about how cool this story actually is. Now I'll tell you something, Alfred Hitchcock said, Alfred Hitchcock said that what happened to her after the story ended is that she tried to kill her second husband that same way, but he had forgotten to plug in the freezer. And so when she took out the leg of lamb, it was too soft and she couldn't kill him. So that's kind of interesting. All right, I do have to give a little warning here. Y'all, you have to beware of books that make you root for behavior you don't actually condone. Okay, so, um, oh, Raoul Dahl helped write one of the James Bond films. That's interesting, Dracon. I guess that just goes along with how they were friends. That's cool. Thank you for sharing that. All right, so beware. When a book makes you agree with something that you don't really agree with, you have to put yourself on guard. Like. Don't let yourself get sucked into it too easily. Be like, warning, warning, warning. My moral compass is spinning around. All right. Now, you, you can't really understand this story unless you understand the illusion in the title. So Lamb to the Slaughter is a reference. It's an illusion. It's, it's, it's a multiple layer illusion. So it first started. Oh, and I have to tell you that this is the slide deck of the gifts or GIFs, however you want to say it. All right, so here is how this illusion is multi-layered. So first we have, it's in the Bible, and it's in multiple places. I just pick this one, that Jeremiah eleven nineteen. I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought to the slaughter, and I knew not that they had devised devices against me. You'll hear, like, like a sheep before his shearer is dumb, so I open up my mouth, right? Like there are a lot of allusions in the Bible, references to lambs being led places. And the reason is that they're like quiet and docile and they just go and then people do horrible things to them. And so in this, and then lamb to the slaughter became an illusion that meant like something that was innocent and ignorant. So you were innocent and you didn't know what they were going to do to you. And so if you're a lamb to the slaughter, you like something bad is going to happen to you and you don't know what it is and you are at least partly innocent. And Mark C, I know that lamb is like obsessive. I'm obsessed. All right. So it's that innocence and ignorance. And so in the story, we're going to see that. We're going to see that. You got to understand it. One of the very first words in the story, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The ninth word in the story says the curtains drawn. And I thought I would mention this for a minute because I think that word to draw the curtains, we're like, what does that even mean? And I talked about it a couple of classes ago about how Amelia Bedelia was told to draw the curtains and she like literally drew a picture. And I think it's another example of how a word can feel simple 
And we did this last class, I think, or the class before, where there's a word that feels simple, but yet has so many meanings. So let's look at the meanings in the word draw. So in draw, we have pull. So you can like draw something along or you can pull the curtains closed. Um, like if you've ever had a pull toy, you can be like drawing it behind you. Um, making a straight line or figure. So like drawing with a pencil. Remove or extract, right? So draw water from a well. Select one. Draw a card. Um, like take a card, but also draw like draw lots like in the lottery, which is like the other dark, dark story that we've read. You can draw lots. You can take a card. It also can be um, displace a certain amount of water. So like a boat has a certain amount of draw. And then there are phrases to draw out, to draw the line and to draw blood. And then there's also the like other forms of the word. This is just the verb forms of the word. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Draw a weapon. Mark C. Yeah. Draw a weapon. Exactly. Um, and then uh, Strudel Kitty, I will draw you Saruman like poison is drawn from a wound. Love it. Look at you with the illusion. I mean, awesome. Yeah. And Dracon here with some wisdom. If you're alone with your wife and she's pregnant, it's probably not a good idea to tell her you've been cheating on her and are leaving her. Yeah. <laughs> Note to self, right? Note to self. Okay. So let's look at what's going on. The room was warm and clean, the curtains drawn, the two table lamps alight, hers and the one by the empty chair opposite. On the sideboard behind her, two tall glasses, soda water, whiskey, fresh ice cubes in the thermos bucket. And so I feel like this is the setting of just this bucolic, remember that whale of a word, bucolic, just this idyllic setting, you know, like you're going to come home to this cottage and it's just peace and light, sweetness and light. And I feel like um, it's important to, to pause and look at this because Dahl spends quite a bit of time, like the, the first four or five paragraphs setting the mood. And the mood is the feeling that is created in the reader. So what is the mood? Like if you had to describe it in one or two words, I just spent a lengthier time describing it, but describe this mood here as she's home waiting for her husband what what is the mood that doll is creating there tell me what you think and i at switching to a different background and i will let you guys choose did you like the other one better or do you like this one and later i will switch to another one and you can see like this thing is pretty cool so all right, looking for your looking for your um, for your things. Anxiety, tension, interesting. Really, like you think that's the mood that's being created before he gets home. Like when it's talking about how she's like got a smiling air. It's tranquil. The lights are the lamps are lit. The drinks are ready. That. That's interesting. Could the empty chair be foreshadowing? Ooh, Mark C. Nice. Okay. So Mark C, I don't agree with you about the anxiety and tension, but I will definitely agree with the empty chair thing. Cloudfall, peaceful with a hidden layer of tension created by just how perfect everything is. Nice. Uh, Drake, I'm using StreamYard. StreamYard. The empty chair comment was Cloudfall's. Mark's no. Afterwards. Mark. Oh, I Mark C asked a question about the empty chair. Mr. Vanser is saying it was Cloud Falls about the empty chair. Oh, oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Like maybe it came up again. Okay. Yeah, it, like Cloud Falls said it a little while ago. And, and then Mark, Mark said, it. said it. Okay. I need to go away after you compliment me on it. Oh, uh oh. <laughs> Sorry, Mark C. Um, okay, so then she says this. There was a slow, oh gloomy. Okay. Mm, 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 mm. I'm reading this very differently from you guys, but I think sometimes it's hard to reread it without knowing what's coming. So there was a slow smiling air about her and everything she did, the drop of a head as she bent over her sewing was curiously tranquil. Her skin, for this was her six months with child, had acquired a wonderful translucent quality. The mouth was soft and the eyes with their new placid look seemed larger and larger, darker than before. This is an interesting thing we have not seen before. This is a poetic device called a blazon. Um, and that is sometimes spelled with an S. So like blazon, B-L-A-Z-O-N. In the French, you probably would say blazon. 
And what a blazon is, remember Anna Snell, who used to come to class and she was Canadian? She could probably correct our pronunciation on this. But what a blazon is, is where you list the physical attributes of the subject, usually female, and the Elizabethan poets absolutely loved it. Petrarch made it famous. One of Shakespeare's sonnets is a famous blazon, which is Sonnet 130, my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun, corals more red than the lips. It's like a negative blazon. Um, and it's from the French word, this is interesting, that describes a coat of arms in writing, like, you know, the shield and the coat of arms. Like if you had to describe it, like a lion rampant on a silver background with chartreuse leaves or whatever, that is called a blazon, the description of a coat of arms. And so we call these, um, we call these, uh, oh, sorry, I clicked one by accident. Um, and um, so that's, that's what a blazon is. So if you see something in writing where someone's like listing a bunch of characteristics, again, usually female, that's a blazon. And I promise you that very few, even English teachers know that term. So I was excited to see an example of it in this, um, in this one. Um, okay, let's see what Drew has to say. It's a beautiful scene, so perfect to New Fork. You know something bad is about to happen. It's like watching a vase smash, but first is Myron, it's every quality. And so it looks like a bunch of you are in agreement that sometimes something can be too perfect. So that's kind of nice. All right, get ready, you guys, get ready. For her, this was always a blissful time of day. She knew he didn't want to speak much until the first drink was finished. And she, on her side, on her side, was content to sit quietly and join her company, his company, after the long hours alone in the house. She loved to luxuriate in the presence of this man and to feel almost as a sunbather feels the sun, that warm male glow that came out of him to her when they were alone together. All right, here, I want you guys to try your turn, your turn, almost as a blank feels the blank. So we had in her line, in her line, almost as a sunbather feels the sun, almost as a blank feels the blank. I want to know, describe that feeling when you're like basking in the glow of another person. What is that? Um, okay, that's pretty funny. Beautiful day. And then the zombie apocalypse starts. That's pretty funny. All right. Thank you. Okay. Almost as a blank feels the blank. How describe that feeling. I want to see it. Oops, I can't say nice job till I see some examples. Let me see some. Almost as a blank feels the blank. I'll go back and show you the example again. And to feel almost as a sunbather bather, bather feels the sun. Almost as a swimmer dives into the pool. You know, that's an interesting one, Clapfall, because um that's that's an interesting one because for swimmers diving into pools like usually like refreshing and it feels good so it's a slightly different feeling but also positive who else has one for me is clawfall gonna get the only good job peeps okay as a swimmer feels the first first splash of a recently opened pool yeah nice who else has one for me let me see your work a baby feels his sad loving arms yeah i think I think you're right that there is this almost paternal relationship there. Yeah. As a reader lives in the pages of their favorite story. Oh yeah. That like comforting glow. Nice. Nice. Like it. Okay. All right. You've earned it. Good job. Peeps. Oh, Andrew as a plant drinks in carbon. Yeah, absolutely. Just like that. <laughs> um, okay. So what do you think that simile says about their relationship that, She's like basking in his glow, like a sunbather in the sun. Do a sunbather and the sun have an equal relationship? The restaurant critic, that's nice. What, what do you think that says about the relationship? Like if all you knew about the relationship was that she felt around her husband like a sunbather in the sun, what, what would you think you could say about that relationship? What is that? simile trying to tell us. Let me see what you think. Now, I'm going to share something else with you that this whole story to me is a, a harken back to this, this idea in Victorian times um, where the wife was to be, they called it the angel in the house, the angel in the house. And Coventry Patmore 
was a poet, an English poet, who wrote a poem called The Angel in the House about his wife. And look at the lines of this poem. Man must be pleased, but him to please is woman's pleasure. Like, Men must be pleased, but that's okay because women just exist to make sure men are happy. Down to the gulf of his condoled necessity, she casts her best. She flings herself. So like her very best efforts, she exerts on things that are just basic needs for him. How often flings for not, meaning she doesn't get appreciated, and yokes her heart to an icicle or whim, meaning that her husband is often like super cold or only likes her sometimes and then, you know, acts like this guy. And then whose each impatient word provokes another, not from her, but him. So like the more impatient he gets, it doesn't make her impatient. It makes him even more impatient. It's like so awful. Anyway, so I put in this little give this 1950s housewife. So I think that this story is a very strong commentary on kind of 1950s, um, you know, leave it to Beaver, if you've ever seen that show on like Nick at Night or something. But that idea of like that, this this idea that somehow the perfect family or the perfect relationship exists in this very unequal thing where the woman is totally subservient to her husband. And Dahl is really calling that out because he, he is describing her completely as an angel in the house. But yeah, I mean, I know, Dracon, you're like, what? This poem is awful. But I'm telling you, this was a huge thing. In fact, Virginia Woolf, the writer Virginia Woolf said that every female writer's number one job was to kill the angel in the house. Yeah, it's an important thing to understand. I promise you, if you start writing about the angel in the house in, a, in an essay, you will win points. All right. So the first sign of trouble in paradise. And as he spoke, he did an unusual thing. He lifted his glass and drained it in one swallow, although there was still half of it, at least half of it left. Uh-oh, right? Uh-oh. And so here we have this like utopia dystopia thing going on. And I was curious, what do you think? Can something be a utopia for one person and a dystopia for other people? Ooh. Michael Archer, it's like the one, this is back to the angel in the house, like the one rich kid that tries to tag along with the popular group, buying them things, yet he's only appreciated when the superior group is in a good mood. Ooh, ouch, yes. Um, Cloudfall, I totally agree with you. Glad I live now. Um, can, can something be a utopia for one person and a dystopia for another? So like, can I just absolutely love something and somebody else absolutely hate it? Yeah, that danger word, unusual, you're right. Michael Archer. Utopia for the dictator, maybe. Okay, so uh, anyway, she went on, I'll get you some cheese and crackers first. I don't want it, he said. And when I read that, I thought, oh, it's like, it's not that he doesn't just want that. It's like he doesn't want her either. You know, like when he says, I don't want it, it's like foreshadowing that he's not going to want her too. Like he doesn't want her or the cheese and crackers. Sit down, he said, just for a minute, sit down. It wasn't until then that she began to get frightened. And I think this is kind of ironic because who should be frightened right now? <laughs> um, so there, So in the story, it says, and he told her. It didn't take long, four or five minutes at most. And she sat very still through it all, watching him with a kind of dazed horror as he went further and further away from her with each word. But Dahl never tells us what he actually says. Why not? Why doesn't he tell her, why not, why doesn't he tell us the reader what Sam actually said? Why not tell us what the reason he's leaving is? Like, why not tell us what this reason is? I think there are some interesting possibilities as to why he doesn't tell us. And I'm curious if you could think of any. And he says this, and I know it's kind of a bad time to be telling you. And she's like, Bit of an understatement, governor, right? Okay, Cloudfall. Suspense, suspense and intrigue. A place to let the reader use their imaginations. Nice. Yeah, suspense and intrigue. There, it really is an intrigue. Like, what is it? Like, what is it? What's going on? I think there are some other, I think there's some others too. Let's see. Um, one thing I'll mention, I'll, I'll, I'll 
Well, I'll go ahead and say what I think one thing. Okay, we need to draw our own conclusion. Is it something worth killing your spouse over? Mark, see, that's exactly what I was going to say. I think you're right, Cloudfall. It creates suspense. It creates intrigue. And Mark, it creates this moral dilemma. We have to consider what could be said that would be so bad that it would make you want to kill them. And like, what, what could they say? And then he says this. Of course, I'll give you money and see you're looked after. And she's like, oh, well, okay then. <laughs> you know, oh, well, then I guess it'll be just fine. I'll get the supper, she managed to whisper. And this time he didn't stop her. And when she walked across the room, she couldn't feel her feet touching the floor. And I think we realize there how like upset she is, how disturbed she is, how like absolutely freaking out she is. She can't even feel her feet. Like she's just like on autopilot right now. And I was curious if you have ever felt numb like that, where it's just like you like something shocked you so much that you just felt numb, like you just couldn't even process it. And I think I love the description in here of how she reacts, because I think that doll is really showing us the her state of mind. And he needs to do that. And Jason every single day. Right. And as she went through the living room, she saw him standing over by the window with his back to her and she stopped. What do you think she's thinking? What do you think she's thinking there? What do you think she's thinking? While well, you tell me, I'm going to go switch to this other background and you guys can tell me what you think about it. Drew says that when he was in third grade, he got a 4% on a math test. <laughs> well, at least you could figure out the percent, you know? Um, oh, you're about to get the vaccine. Well, good luck. Um, so what do you think she's thinking here? Huh? What if I bet I could? Nice, nice. If it's dystopia for others, then I'm in therapy. I bear the others, so be worried for me. Oh, interesting. Okay. So that's like, um, like in uh, the giver, you know, like in the giver, really. Something that's dark about it for me is how I don't think she was thinking. She seemed to do it instinctually and then realize how horrible the thing was she just did. Strudel Kitty, I think you are on to something. I, I think, you know what, let me highlight that again. I don't think she was thinking. She just did it instinctively. The thing that's so dark about that strudel kitty is that it shows how dark we are as people, right? Like that the instinct that we have is to kill someone. Like, I wonder, have you ever had that instinct? Like not necessarily to kill someone, but like to just lash out, like just physically lash out. Yeah, so <laughs> formulate a plan, right? I'm not looking for it, <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, so let's look at, let's move forward here. Um, and he says, don't make supper for me. I'm going out. And it's like, she's not really processing what he's saying. And so he's like, just shut up, just shut up, shut her up, up. right? Like, just shut up. I don't want to hear you. I don't want to. He just wants to like get out of Dodge, right? Like he doesn't want to deal with her feelings. He doesn't care. Yeah, Michael Archer, it's fight or flight reaction. It's like primal, right? It's not, <laughs> God, well, this isn't how to deal with your emotion, kids, right? Don't try this at home. And and you're right, Michael Archer, it is fight or flight. Um, but it's kind of scary that that's our primal emotion, right? Kind of, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> I love it. I have a large frozen lamb leg, he's looking away. <laughs> right, yeah. Oh, okay, so this is interesting, this idea Siri, of, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but looking at him with love and then this flash of anger and it's like, boom. Yeah. So nice. Um, yeah, guys, you guys are so amazing. All right. At that point, Mary Maloney simply walked up behind him and without any pause, she swung the big frozen leg of lamb high in the air and brought it down as hard as she could on the back of his head. Y'all, I know it won't surprise you, but I did not have a frozen leg of lamb. I did not. So we're just gonna have the puppet. <laughs> and so she takes the frozen leg of lamb and she goes, bam, just like that, bam. <laughs> it's like Zootopia when they have the drug that releases the animals from, I've never seen that movie. Um, I know, I know, I, uh, I don't know about you, but my fight or flight response has never led me to murder anyone. No, nope, me neither. And. Um, I do not have a turkey. I'm sorry, I do not have a turkey puppet. 
Okay, so I'm curious. Here, I found this gif of this 1950s housewife who's vacuuming while doing the hula hoop. The hula hoop came out in the 50s. Oh, Mark, see you watch out, Mr. Vance. I would never hit him on the head with a leg of lamb. Um, <laughs> um, in what ways did her husband underestimate her? Like, I feel like there was a lot of underestimation of those 1950s housewives. And I'm curious, tell me a way that you think her husband underestimated her. And I have another question following it up. Who seems to really have the power in this relationship? Um, like who seems to have the power and then who does have the power? Because I think to me, it looks like he has the power, but does he really? So I don't know, it's kind of cute. Um, <laughs> and then the funny thing was, I thought this was so funny. It says, and the funny thing was that he remained standing there for at least four or five seconds, gently swaying. Then he crashed to the carpet. <laughs> it's like almost funny, almost funny. Yeah, let's see, he expected her docility and he underestimated her ability to protest, to react, to fight back against this. And then the puzzlement of, did I do that? Maybe he's still not saying, oh wait, he falls. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely, yeah, I think you guys are really getting it. All right, so let's look at this conflict for a second here, because, right, and then he dies. Dun, 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 dun. Um, we have this conflict here, because we have two different conflicts going on in this story. The first conflict we have, we have this conflict of Mary versus Sam. So we have this conflict, this external conflict of Mary versus Sam, of, you know, he wants to leave her, she'd rather have him dead than leave her. Or I don't even know if we can say that, right? Because did she really think about it? But anyway, there you go. And then the Mary versus the police. So we have these two conflicts going on, both of these conflicts. Okay, the husband is really dependent on the wife. She does more than he thinks. She's capable of, well, we know what she's capable of. Nice, Mark. Yeah, he, he she does do a lot more than he thinks. Definitely more than he appreciates, right? Um. It's so interesting that we know it takes place in the future by the quote, everything was automatic now, down the steps to the step. Oh, it's not the future. I'm glad you said that. That isn't talking about the future. It means she's on automatic. She's on like autopilot. Everything was automatic. Like she wasn't even thinking. She was just behaving. I love this. She has the control of frozen lamb legs. So she has the true power. That's awesome. All right. So what's interesting about these conflicts is that I'm curious what you think. Could the story function without either of these conflicts? Like if there wasn't the conflict between Sam and Mary, like if he didn't want to leave her, would you have a story? And then if she weren't trying to hide the evidence from the police, would it really be a story? Curious about what you think. Could the story function? If you took out one of those conflicts, would you still have a story? Curious about what you think. All right, she told herself, so I've killed him. <laughs> like, it's just so matter of fact. Hold on a minute. I forgot to say, Serignus wanted me to let you know that he wanted to eat the lamb and he would have just eaten it frozen. He would have just eaten the bones and everything and she didn't even need to, like, cook it. He would have just eaten it. Yeah. So... Interesting. Okay. So Cloudfall says if he hadn't left her, then she would have just continued to act like the perfect house angel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, it would be boring. Exactly. Okay. And then she says, she says, it was extraordinary now how clear her mind became all of a sudden. As soon as she kills him, all of a sudden it's like, and I'm like, boy, did it. I literally wrote this in my notes. Boy, did it. And then she thinks, what about, what about the child? What were the laws about murderers with unborn children? And so I think that um, that her thoughts, at least what we are seeing of them, are definitely designed to act like she doesn't care about herself. She doesn't care if she gets caught, if she goes to prison, but she cares about what happens to the child. And I'm curious, do you buy this? Is she really only worried about her child or is she manipulating us? Like. Is she withholding thoughts from us as the reader? Is this a reliable 
narrator. Curious what you think there. Ooh, that's an interesting idea. At the start, it seems she's trying to convince herself that he loves her. Mm. I wonder if it's possible that maybe some of why she was acting the way she was was because she already knew that there was a problem. That is an interesting insight, Michael Archer. All right, so irony. We've got so much irony in this story. So we have this irony of she practices being natural. She says, yes, I think, and a can of peas. And she practices it multiple times. And then she goes through... Um, she she goes to the store and she says it and it's like so ironic that you're going to practice being natural like that's that's ironic right um and then she says to the she says to the guy at the grocery store i'm taking a chance on it this time on the lamb and i'm like oh yeah you're taking a chance boy are you taking a chance right and the guy, it is so this is so funny because the grocery store guy is like, well, what are you going to give him after dinner? And she, and he's thinking dessert and she's thinking a funeral, right? It's so awesome. And then um, when she gets home, when she gets home and she's like all ready to pretend to be shocked, she's like, um, Oh, it turned out it really was rather a shock. Like she had got herself so into the, she'd gotten herself so into this part that she forgot that her husband's lying dead in her living room floor. Um, yeah, you're right. She calls herself a murderer. She doesn't try to justify it. She's just like, and, and you're right. Um, and let's see here. And yeah, you're right. Can she use her? Her child and Dracon, these are inner thoughts, right? She kills a dude with a lamb, so maybe don't trust her. <laughs> I like that. That would be such a good t-shirt for this book. That would be such a good t-shirt. All right, so she tells her story again to the police, right? This time, right from the beginning. And Mrs. Van says, Mrs. Van says, I need to get a puppet to tell this part. No, you know what? I need, I need a lightsaber. This kind of thing needs a lightsaber. All right, notice notice how what's important is what's left out. What's important is what's left out, both when he was telling her he was leaving and now. So often in literature, what's important, left out is what is, let, let me say it like Yoda, left out important it is. Is that right? Is that how Yoda would say it? I think so. And so then the police say this to her, get the weapon and you've got the man. And I couldn't even, I couldn't even help but think about this scene in Lord of the Rings when Eowyn faces the witch king of Angmar and, and says, I am no man. And it was like, I just felt that way. Yes, murder with a leg of lamb. Okay, and then Michael Archer just had an epiphany. I just realized that the reason it seems automatic when she kills him is because she, her inner self knows that he never really loved him and she could do it all along. Oh, 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 Cloudfall. If important it is left out, it will be nice. Nice, very nice. Okay, both of those are nice. The hashtag on that comment, super nice. All right, get the weapon and you've got the man. Question for you, is this the perfect murder? Do you think it's the perfect murder? I'll let you chime in on that. It mentions the police are looking for a spanner. A spanner is just another name for um, a wrench. So it you can see it kind of like spans the space. So that's what a spanner is. And then how are both, can you make the argument that both Mary and Sam are lambs to the slaughter? Do you think so? Can they both be considered lambs to slaughter? So is it a perfect murder? I'm seeing the yes, yes, yes. And then... How are they both lambs to the slaughter? All right. And then she says this, like, come, let me cook for you. Patrick would never forgive me if I allowed you to remain in his house. But wait a minute. I'm calling him Sam. I've been calling him Sam. Is Sam the police officer? I might have been using the wrong word all this time. That's all right. Give me a hashtag English teacher fail. Um, oh, no. Throwing a wrench in their plans. Oh, strudel kitty. Oh, my goodness. All right, so if I allowed you to remain in his house without offering you decent hospitality, right? And it's just so ironic. Like Michael would never forgive me if I 
made sure that you helped me get away with his murder. I mean, it's if I, oh, Sam is the butcher. You're right. Sam is the guy at the grocery store. I've been calling her husband, Sam. Her husband is Patrick. You know what? They all, I should have remembered that because they all have like super, super, super Irish names. Everybody has Irish names, even the police. And my name, true trivia, my name was going to be Patrick if I was a boy. All right. It would be a favor to me if you'd eat it up. <laughs> and they think, they think she means it would be a favor to me because like I'd be, I mean, it's so, it's so crazy. It would be a favor to me in, in so many, so many ways, right? So here's this irony again. She thinks, boy, are you doing me a favor, helping me get away with murder? And he's thinking, boy, are you doing me a favor, giving me dinner? And it's so funny. It's like so great. And the police officer says to the other detective, she wants us to finish it. She said so. Be doing her a favor. <laughs> Like, oh, you have no idea the favor. Yes, yes. And she says it with a straight face. It's so funny. And Cloudfall is like, yeah, Mrs. Van Star, you are totally confusing me. I'm so sorry, Patrick and Sam. All right. It wasn't a very satisfying. <laughs> it's so funny. Yes, it is dramatic irony. Absolutely dramatic irony that we know they're eating the evidence. They don't know they're eating the evidence. And dramatic irony almost always leads to either comedy or suspense. So this is so funny. It's like, so funny. Oh, I get it. Satisfying, like filling. Oh, very good, Strudel Kitty. And then the police officer says, personally, I think it's right here on the premises, probably right under our very noses. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, <laughs> again with the irony, right? Okay, so it's there is this situational irony going on here where the police are literally slaughtering the evidence. I mean, the police are destroying the evidence from the crime. <laughs> and it's like, okay, bye, Ethan, good luck. And then it's situational irony also that they're treating her better than her husband does, but she's deceiving them. Like she's totally deceiving them and they're being all nice to her. It is so ironic. Like her husband, yeah, it's like she was treating her husband so nice. He treated her terribly. And then the police are treating her nice and she's lying to them. It would have been funnier if he smelled his fork of lamb. That is so funny. Um, okay, and Drew says, the further we go down this rabbit hole, the darker this book gets. He says, it's true. even darker reasons for this book. Yes. <laughs> oh, and he just keeps going. It's like all recursive. It's so funny. Yes, yes. It just gets darker and darker and darker. All right. And then we have theme. Okay, going to vote on it. Going to vote on it. Pick a theme, any theme. I chose three. And it's possible, of course, that there are more themes than this. But I'm... I'm submitting these as three possible themes. Vote on which one you like the best. Um, that we overlook people's true nature when we have preconceived notions about them. Like how the police didn't, they underestimated her thinking that she was just this housewife who, you know, wears an apron and makes lamb. And then her husband underestimated her. She underestimated herself. And then role reversals where like the husband is now the weak one, like he's the lamb to the slaughter instead of her, like they switched roles. And then betrayal. I think there's betrayal where he betrays, Patrick betrays, betrays Mary, Mary betrays Patrick. I think we can have a deep discussion about who betrayed who worse, right? Curious. And then um, how does Mary, I was curious about this. How does Mary somehow stay the victim? Like, why is she so sympathetic? Why are we still on her side at the end of this story? I think it's genius on Dahl's part. Like, I think Raul Dahl is an absolute genius that could do that. Um, okay, so then the story is told in the third person limited omniscience. Okay, so we can only read Mary's mind. We can't read the police officer's minds. We can't read the mind of her husband. And I'm curious, how would it have been different if we could have known what Sam was thinking? And do you think Dahl could have carried it off? Do you think that Dahl could have carried it off if he had let us in on that? Okay, not probably one, because even though Mary was betrayed, she got her revenge. So that's not betrayal. Well, Clawfall, I think you could argue that she also betrayed him by murdering him, that that's a betrayal as well. Okay, 
So, wow, Ethan, that's something when you can be back so fast, you're still here. Can you choose the non-existent option of deception? Yes, I actually think betrayal should be deception. Well, I think there are two cases of betrayal, Michael Archer. Um, and I think you could also argue that there are three because I think it's possible that she betrays the police because since her husband worked for the police, I think in some ways it's a betrayal. Um, but I love the idea of deception. I love the idea of deception. Strudel Kitty says, I think the comedy would be lost in an omniscient view. I think you are totally right. I think you're totally right. I definitely do. All right, <clears throat> All right you guys. That's the end of this class. Serignus will mention the next class. The next class. She deceives herself into loving her husband. Ooh, ooh, wow, that's powerful. All right, Serignus, tell us about the next book. All right, so I don't have a voice for Serignus. I haven't picked one yet, so he's just going to talk and sound remarkably like Mrs. Vanstar. All right, the next book we're reading is King Arthur and His Knights of the Round Table. It is not dark. It is a novel, though, and it looks thick, but it's actually really um, quite small. It's not huge, and um, the font is not tiny. The very first class of this is going to be on May 14th. That'll give you, no, I'm sorry, that can't be right. It will be, sorry, we're past that. It will be June 11th. So you're getting, it's not super small, but you're getting some time. June 11th is the first class. I'm going to put the title. I will also be sending out, if you guys get the email, you'll get an email about this. And I would suggest um, that you... Um, no, we're not doing the Dover version. We're doing this version by Roger Lancelin Green. Um, I mean, you're welcome to read the Dover version, but this is a slightly different one. Um, and then, uh, you know what, Michael Archer, I'm going to respond to your comment. I don't want the character limit any longer because it's hard for me to see when it's really long comments. It's harder for me to track them. So I, I actually like it this way. Sorry that it's a pain. Um, it's it's not necessarily lighthearted. It's not necessarily lighthearted. Um, I'm going to try to figure out a way to set up like some kind of watch party so that we can all watch a King Arthur movie together when we're done. But we're going to start with the first. What we're going to read is the first section, book one, The Coming of Arthur. So that's the section that you're going to read. And it's only like 95 pages or something. So it's not terrible. Um, and I mean, terrible. What, how could reading a book be terrible? I really, 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 I, I think this is a decent version because it covers all the main parts of Arthurian legend while still being digestible. Now, I will mention one other thing in case you're interested is that Usborne also makes, like if you're interested in kind of a simple King Arthur, Usborne makes an uh, illustrated one that's kind of nice. If you have a younger sibling who might want to read along, um, this one's kind of nice too. But this is the one we'll actually be discussing. We'll be discussing it on June 11th and then, um, and then moving on from then. I have my dates somewhere, but I'll send it out in the email. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Oh, put in the comments. Tell me what you think about using this stream yard rather than having my picture in front of this, in front of the slide deck. What do you think about the screen stream yard? Did you like, um, Ooh, okay. I'm going to have to write down that title. King Arthur legend of the sword. All right. I'll write that down. Um, I'll go check it out. Uh, what did you think about stream yard? Did you guys like it? Not like it? I hope you liked it. I liked being able to highlight your comments. Um, what do you think? All right. Okay. All right, you guys. I am going to, can I pin Tessa's comment? I can't fully see her profile pic. Yep. He just wants to show the comments so he, she, he can see what it is. 
I can't really see it either. I can't tell what it is. No, but if you show it on screen, they'll be able to see it. I did. I just put oh, it up on okay. screen. I still can't see it. Mr. Vanstar is like, it's if you road. put it on screen, they'll be able to see it. It's road. a what? I can't tell. Anyway. Roses. Oh, roses. Okay. How do you sign up for the mailing list? Go to, go to this. I'll put it in the chat. I'll put it in the chat. Go to giftedguru.com and click on English class. You'll see English class up at the top and you'll be able to read all about it and click the thing to sign up. It's a picture of dead roses. Oh, that's happiness. All right. Strudel Kitty, your, your view of the story has increased because of your satisfied joke. That's awesome. Okay. Uh, picture of dead roses. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dracon. Okay, guys, vote on StreamYard. Tell me what you think. Yay, nay. Did you like being able to see the, the comments highlighted? Did you like that? I like that. Um, I liked it. And the backgrounds. I like being able to do the backgrounds. Oh, guess what? Guess what? Watch this. I got, oh, you can't see it. I have a background that's like King Arthur. But look, it lets me do this. Hi, everyone. All right, I'm going to end the broadcast here. And, oh, you guys liked it. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. Well, y'all, I will see you June 11th. And let me know if you have any problems getting the book. I will put description stuff in the um, just, I will put information in the description box of this video and I will send it in an email. I'll wait a week or so to give you a chance to sign up if you haven't already. All right. A close up. Hi. Oh, guys, trivia, trivia. Before I let you go, we figured out what was making the flickering was when these lights behind me were certain colors, when they were like a darker color, I have this remote that can change the colors. And when they were darker, Mr. Vanstar figured that out. I should do full screen when I do the puppets. Yes, Mark C. Serignus says yes, yes, yes. All right, y'all. You guys have a good weekend. It was so wonderful to see you. You know you are my favorites. All right, you guys take care. Have a good weekend.